Good evening, everybody. Uh, I, as I was thinking about uh, what to share this evening, um, I'd like to share a word of encouragement. Uh, we're facing a lot of things right now that are uh, very different than anything I've ever experienced, and probably most of us have experienced. Right now, there's people that are uh, scared. They're worried about uh, losing their job. They're worried about what they're going to do without an income. They're also uh, scared of getting the virus, scared of getting sick. Uh, they're afraid of if they can get enough food, if they can get uh, their groceries and things like that. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. Uh, and it's, it's actually a blessing in disguise in many ways. Uh, for us as people, uh, and especially as Christians, it's actually good for us to actually uh, check our own hearts and see where is our security. Uh, what are we putting our trust in? Uh, it's very easy when things are going well to come to church. and We sing songs like, On Christ the solid rock I stand, All other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, But wholly lean on Jesus' name. And it's easy to sing that when times are good. But the question is, when things are difficult, when things are shaken, when uh, things that we were putting confidence in that we didn't realize we were, uh, it scares us sometimes. It unnerves us. And we realize that uh, there were other things that we were actually putting our security in other than simply in the Lord Jesus and simply in the Word of God. And uh, so it's actually a blessing. It's actually a good time right now to examine our own hearts and uh, to open our hearts before the Lord and say, Lord, is it, you know, what's, what does it look like to you? And uh, to examine our hearts and see, is our trust in Christ? Is it on the Word of God? Or have these other things around us kind of attached themselves to us? And uh, we start trusting in those things. Well, this evening we would like to look at the Word of God and look at promises that uh, the Lord Jesus left with us while he was here. And uh, it's, he is the cornerstone and uh, he is that rock. Um, in the Old Testament, when uh, Moses was uh, going there into the wilderness, and uh, the Lord told him that he's going to stand there before him in Horeb. And uh, Christ is that rock. Uh, that rock was symbolic of Christ. That same rock that Moses hit with his rod and, and water flowed out from it. Uh, that rock was a type of Christ, and Christ is that rock. And uh, no all other ground is sinking sand other than him. So uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd like to uh, do most of our study this evening and the message this evening out of uh, the Gospel of John. And uh, if we would use a text verse, we would use it from John chapter 16, uh, verse 33 it says, And these things have I spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And uh, we see several things in this verse. We see that uh, he's spoken these things to us so that we have an opportunity to have peace. There's another promise that he's given to us in here. He says, in the world, we are going to have tribulation. Uh, we're going to have difficulty. We're going to have challenges. Uh, that we're going to face unpleasant things. Uh, that's something that, uh, as Christians, as God's people, it would be very nice if we wouldn't face tribulation. It would be nice if we wouldn't face trouble. But Jesus has actually promised us here that in the world we are going to have tribulation. But the third thing that he promises here, but he tells us to be of good cheer. He tells us to take heart because he says, I have overcome the world. And uh, the beautiful promise there is that just as Jesus has overcome the world, so likewise we can overcome the world also. And uh, Jesus faced difficulty, he faced suffering, he faced tribulation in this world. Uh, but 
like he overcame, so can we also. If you remember, uh, I believe it's in the book of Acts, it, there in, in Antioch, the believers, those early disciples that were following after Christ, they were first called Christians at Antioch. And that word Christians means little followers of Christ, means that they were following after, uh, after Christ and their lives looked like Christ. And so uh, we can take heart and we can overcome just as what Jesus did. So now turning back a few pages like to uh, look at John chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading here at verse 1. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. This, uh, here in verse 2, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If you were to uh, look up that word mansions, you could look at it in some other translations, or you could look up the Greek word in it, and it means many dwelling places, or the idea is is a very big uh, building that has a lot of rooms in it. In my Father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. We'll come back to that in a little bit, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, but uh, the word picture we have there is that every one of us have an opportunity to have a room in the kingdom of heaven, and each one of us have an opportunity to have a personal uh, abiding place uh, with the Lord. Um, Jesus went on to say here, dropping down to verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then uh, we'll drop down again uh, a few more verses here uh, to verse 12. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye shall see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Notice that we had talked earlier uh, there in uh, verse 2 where it says, In my Father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. And then here we see in verse 23 that he says that uh, I and the Father, we will come unto him and we will make our abode with him. And I believe this, this mansion here, a lot of times we have believed or have been taught or we get this idea somehow that when we get to heaven, we're going to see uh, these mansions and we're going to have mansions there and so forth. And I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. Um, I guess I don't really mind what I think I'm going to like what's there, even though it may be a little different than what I have an idea in my head. But 
I think this idea that Christ was trying to communicate to his disciples and also to us through his word is that this is not something that he had in a mind that's going to be sometime in eternity, sometime in heaven, but I believe it's something that we can actually experience in a large degree now already of having a relationship with the Father. And I think this whole uh, idea that we're looking at is, and the question that I'm trying to answer here for you this evening and for us to consider, is how is it that we can have peace in a world when there's a lot of things that are not at peace? How is it possible for the Christian to have peace when many other people don't have peace? And I think one of the key points here is, and to me is a very important point, is that we can have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. We can have a relationship with Him and with His presence and with His peace abiding in our hearts. And that gives us the strength that we need. It gives us the power, if you will. It gives us the, uh, the grace we need to face the unknown. Um, let's continue on reading here. He says, uh, verse 25, And these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and be, bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Um, so he's telling us that he's going to give his peace to us, and he's giving us a peace that's different than the world. And so we'd like to consider for a little while, what is this peace? What does it look like? How can we get it? How is it different from the peace that the world gives? If you think about the peace that the world gives, is uh, you maybe uh, buy something new that's exciting, uh, you feel good about it, maybe, uh, and of course that doesn't last forever because it's before too long it gets scratched or starts rusting or starts wearing out or somebody might steal it. Uh, you may get a new set of clothes or whatever that is. And uh, you feel good about it for a little while, but after a while it's out of style and it wears out and doesn't look as nice as it used to. You might uh, eat a good meal. You were hungry before. You ate a good meal. And uh, you eat that meal, and uh, it's only a matter of time you're hungry again. And uh, you need to eat again. Or you might be thirsty. You get a good drink of water, but it's only a matter of time you're thirsty again. Uh, you may build a new house, and uh, you like it, it's nice, but it's only a matter of time that house wears out, and uh, it isn't new anymore. And so everything in this world, everything that's tangible, everything that we can touch or feel or taste or get our hands around, it's temporary. It's not going to last forever. It's going to pass away. And, uh, but it's the, there's a peace that we can have with the Lord Jesus that uh, is eternal. It's not temporary like the things here in this world. And uh, so uh, to build on that, or a couple of verses that helps uh, explain that is, is, is in the beginning of John chapter 17. Uh, Jesus, he's praying this prayer in the garden of Gethsemane just before he's taken to be crucified. And uh, he says, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. To me, this is, this is very, very special. And I think it's very important for uh, believers to grasp and to understand, and that's this fact of eternal life. Uh, right now, there's a lot of people that are afraid. Uh, I'm amazed how afraid people really are. They're actually afraid of getting the virus, and I guess they're afraid of getting the virus because they're afraid it might kill them. And uh, I'm, uh, 
I struggle with fear just like anyone else does. But whenever I struggle with fear, I sometimes take those fears and I think about them and I say, okay, how bad could this really get? Uh, you know, you think about you know, how bad could this really get if it gets as bad as it could get. And usually about as bad as it can get is, is that you die or somebody's going to die or you're not going to survive this situation. Well, you think about the whole idea of dying. And if you ever thought about those fears, usually it doesn't turn out near as bad as you were afraid that it might. And uh, the scripture says that fear has torments, but it also tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. So where there's perfect love and where there's this, this peace and this relationship with the Lord Jesus and with our Heavenly Father through the comfort of the Holy Spirit, there is no room for fear there. But a person who is afraid does not have a sound mind. And a person who is afraid, uh, they are going to be tormented. So as I study the Bible, and uh, others have studied it too, and from what they tell me, there's only two people that we find in the Bible that ever got out of this world alive. We have there in Genesis, Enoch, it says that he walked with God and was not because God took him. We also have uh, Elijah. Uh, he was taken up in a whirlwind. And so those are the two people that we know of that left this planet or left this earth that did not die. Everybody else, including the Lord Jesus, did not leave this earth alive. And so unless Jesus comes back, as we read there in, uh, in Revelation, when he's going to, the heavens are going to roll back like a scroll. They're going to be opened up and he's going to come back. And what we understand and know is the end of the world. Every one of us aren't going to get out of here alive. And so it's just a fact of life. Just as we had a birthday, we're going to have a day when we die. And so we're going to have to face up with that sooner or later. And so if uh, this virus or whatever that's going on or whatever is going to happen is going to take our life, uh, if we have hope in this life only, we're in trouble. But if we have eternal life and we have hope beyond the grave, we don't have anything to be afraid of. Because you see, for the Christian, life here on this earth is as miserable or as difficult or as painful as what it will ever get. But for the unbeliever living here on this earth, this is as good as it will ever get. This is the best that he ever has. Whatever he gets after this is going to be worse. But, what he ha but for the Christian, this is as bad as it's ever going to get. Um, years ago, I heard this story about this mother and son, they had uh, died and they went to heaven. And anyway, this uh, son looked to his mom and he said, you know, mom, he says, we could have been here a lot sooner if you wouldn't have made me eat those whole bran crackers. And, uh, you know, it's maybe a little humorous, but you get the idea. The idea is, is we as Christians, we claim that we have eternal life. We claim eternity is going to be so much better than what we're experiencing now. And yet we fight so hard to stay alive and we fight so hard to stay here and we dread leaving this earth. And uh, so, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Now, I believe we should value life. I, I, think, I don't think we ought to be careless. I think we ought to be careful. Uh, we want to be careful that... Uh, I mean, we're trying as a family to be a little careful that we don't get a virus. We're even more careful that we don't give it to somebody else. I don't think that's wrong. I think that's part of loving our neighbor. But uh, at the same time, we need to have faith to believe that God's going to keep us alive and he's going to sustain us and he's going to help us through whatever we're going to face, regardless what that is. And uh, if, if we don't get out of it alive... Uh, it will be much better for us. It will be difficult for those that are left behind, but it will be much better for us. Uh, see, here in uh, 
this uh, John chapter 17, this was a prayer that Jesus prayed just before he was crucified. Here in about a week uh, is normally when we celebrate Easter or Passover, the resurrection. We celebrate when Jesus rose from the grave. See what's so different from uh, Christianity versus all other religions is, is that with uh, Christianity we have an empty grave. Uh, all other religions of this world, they have a founder, they ha or even ideologies. Uh, they have a founder. They have someone that they can point back to as the founder of their movement, of their school of thought, of their idea, or of their religion, or some guru, or some prophet, or somebody that started this. And they can go to a certain site, a certain grave, or some place on this earth and say this is where they died or this is where his remains are or this is where he was and his remains are somewhere. See, the thing that's so different about Christianity is, is we have an empty grave. We have an empty tomb. Jesus did not stay there. Um, when they came early in the morning, the first day of the week, and the stone was rolled away, they went and they looked inside and they found his grave clothes in there, but they didn't find a body. And they didn't find him either. And it wasn't the disciples that stole him away, like uh, the story that they spread afterward, but he was alive, he was risen, and there is an empty tomb today. Uh, this evening. There's an empty tomb because he is alive and uh, he's not dead anymore. And uh, because he lives, we also can live. And uh, you remember he told them, he, uh, he was talking to the Jewish people and he said that an evil and adulterous generation, they seek after a sign. And he said, there's no sign going to be given them, but of the prophet Jonas. And he was referring back to the Old Testament to where Jonah, he was in the well's belly three days and three nights and he said the Son of Man, or Jesus said he's going to be in the heart of the earth or in the grave three days and three nights and after that he's going to rise again. And uh, he gave that as one sign to prove that he was who he said he was. And uh, he did. He resurrected from the dead. And Jesus said that he would and he did. And uh, he gave that as an example, as a proof that he is the Son of God. And uh, so I'd like to read a couple more verses here in uh, John chapter 3. And uh, Jesus speaking here again, he's saying that, uh, verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth on him that's on Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, this evening, brothers and sisters, it's that simple. It's for those who believe on the Lord Jesus, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, those who believe in Him can have everlasting life. See, what sets the, the believer, the Christian, which in the Bible you will find many, many times Christians were called believers, and it's because they simply believed in Jesus. They believed that Jesus was the Christ. Uh, what sets the believer apart from the, the person of the world, what we were reading earlier, that they, that those that are of the world, they won't see him. They won't uh, know him. Uh, they can't believe on him. It's because they're believing on something else. They're not believing on Jesus. They're believing that something else is going to save them. Uh, they may believe that it's medicine that's going to save them. They may believe it's their money. It might be their, their, uh, the special kind of mask they're wearing to keep the virus away or whatever, but they are believing in something else other than in Jesus. And uh, there's a lot of people that claim they believe in Jesus, but... Uh, it's more than just what we say. It's something that takes place within the heart. That in our heart, 
We by faith believe in him, and we believe he's the Christ. And if we believe he's the Christ, we also love him. And we receive his love that he had for us. And then we also obey his commandments. And so to say that we just, you know, in our heads say that, yeah, we believe, but our hearts and our actions don't back that up. We really don't believe. Give an example. I could go ahead and say that there's a, say there's a chair uh, sitting off here to the side. And I could say, yeah, I believe that chair will hold me but I'll never actually climb up in that chair and stand on it. You'd say, well, sure, you just said that you believe it'll hold you up. I'd say, yeah, I, I think that it will. But if I really believe it's going to hold me up, then I'll actually get on that chair and I'll stand on that chair and I'll trust all my weight on that chair. And see, that's the same way with the Lord Jesus. To say that we believe in him isn't just something that we say in our heads, but it's actually something that we can trust our future into. We, by faith, believe that he is a good God. We believe that he loves us. In John chapter 17, he makes it very clear, and in different places in the gospel he does, is that he loved us exactly the same way that the Heavenly Father loved the Lord Jesus. And you think about that for a minute. Do you really right now believe that the Heavenly Father, the Creator of heaven and earth, the one who made you, loves you, and that you are special to Him as what the Lord Jesus is? That He loves you as much as He loved the Lord Jesus? Okay, if you really believe that, then think about how that, that gives peace into your heart and into your situation regardless of what you face. That even if it's difficult, even if it's painful, but he loves you the same way that he loved the Lord Jesus. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I'm thoroughly convinced that God the Father tried to convince the world, which includes you and I before we knew him, that he loved us. And the most convincing thing that he could think of or that he could do, the strongest language he could use to convince us that he loves us, is he sent his only begotten son, and that son willingly gave his life so that we can have eternal life. And if we don't receive that, if we don't believe that, if we can't by faith uh, get a hold of that and trust our weight and our future in that, uh, there's nothing else that, that will. There's nothing else that, there's no uh, stronger language or no other way that he can better explain to us how much he loved us. And notice he says, For God, verse 17, sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And uh, so it's a very beautiful uh, opportunity and a very beautiful privilege he's given us that every one of us can have that hope we can have that eternal life and we can have that peace we can have that peace that passes understanding um, we uh, we sing this song uh, it's a common song we sing uh, uh, it is well with my soul and uh, it's a common song, but it's the person who wrote that song, I forget his name, but uh, he had just uh, lost a wife and uh, his daughters on a, on a wreck. It, it was an accident. I don't remember if it was a ship sank 
or it was actually a train wreck. It was one or the other. I don't remember which one it was. But uh, he had just experienced that. He had just went through that. And he could honestly say that it is well with his soul. Uh, I can hardly imagine how he was able to do that, having just gone through that. But uh, he could say that it was well with his soul. And uh, it was because he understood this. He understood that there's, a, there's peace in knowing God. There's peace in knowing that God loved him. There's peace in knowing that his wife and daughters were saved. There was peace in knowing that he was going to see them again. And there was also peace in knowing that God was going to give him grace and strength to go through this regardless of what happens. And see, that's something that the world does not have. Uh, Revelation tells us there's a day coming when people and men, their hearts are going to fail them for fear. Uh, they're going to be that afraid that I think they'll actually even have heart attacks because they're actually that afraid. And uh, it's because they don't know the Lord. It's because they don't put their faith and their confidence in Him. And uh, they're afraid. They're, they're afraid. Uh, looking on here a little more now, in John chapter 17, this is in Jesus' prayer. Um, He's, he's praying here, and uh, I'm just going to break in here about uh, verse 9. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And this would have been those that believed on the Lord Jesus when at this time. And he says, all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world because he was getting ready to be crucified and then he was going to ascend back up into heaven. But these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which was Judas Iscariot that betrayed him. And now come I to thee, and these, these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Just pause there for a minute. He says, I have given them, them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh, the word, what word did Jesus give them? Or what is this word that he's talking about? And if we go back to the beginning of John chapter 1, uh, the same book and it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God so who's he talking about here when he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God and this word here in our Bibles is capital letters I believe that's speaking about the Lord Jesus. We could say in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And so if we look back here in John chapter 17, he says, I have given them thy word. He gave of himself. And that Jesus, when he walked here on this earth, he was the expression of the Father. And uh, he goes on to say, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And thou hast sent me into the world even as I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. 
Neither pray I for these alone. And to me, this is very, very special here. When he, here in verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone. And what he's referring to, I believe, is the disciples. The disciples that are with him there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, up until this time, he had been praying for them. But he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, um, let me 